So, um, good morning. As I promised, I will be delivering some of the modules or some of my slides um, via recording and I'll put them onto the forum. I've also made the explanation slightly easier by posting my uh, previous handout, which is more extra and contains most of the what I would have said if I was standing before you so that uh, the delivery will be a little easier. Um, we'll be dealing with evaporation and transpiration and then with infiltration. So let's start with evaporation and transpiration. So evaporation is, we all know what evaporation is. It's, it's, it's just um, how water is moved from the land surface to the atmosphere through the energy of the sun, which makes the sun very important, especially as the element, the driver of the water cycle in hydrology. So with that, the, we consider evaporation under three categories. The first category is what we call the open, what we call the open water surface evaporation. This deals with, um, this deals with just uh, surfaces of say, the sea, rivers, lakes, open water bodies, how much water leaves the surfaces. That is open water evaporation. The next one is evapotranspiration, which combines open water, open surface evaporation, and then evaporation from plants. You can see this evapotranspiration is a combination of evaporation and transpiration, which is what uh, hydrologists use when we want to analyze how much uh, evaporation is leaving uh, the land surface. And then the third is the potential evaporation, which is the evaporation that goes on if there is an infinite amount of water, that is water is there forever or water is plentiful. Um, these are the three uh, categories of what we consider when we want to discuss evaporation. Now, if you, cons if you look at both the hydrology text I've given you, and then the, my own lecture notes, all of these are fully explained and further information is provided. That, that is the basics. Now, what are the factors that affect evaporation? There are about five factors that affect evaporation. These factors are itemized, itemized as below. The solar radiation, the higher the amount of sunshine or the amount of sun rays coming in, the higher you have evaporation going on. So that there is more evaporation during in the in the tropics than in the temperate zones, and correspondingly there is more evaporation during hot months or, or, or summer months. Like if we were to be in the temperate areas, there is more evaporation in the summer months than in the winter months. Again, evaporation is influenced by temperature. The higher the temperature, the more evaporation goes on. Then the water vapor capacity of the air. So if there is less water vapor, there is the tendency for more vapor, more evaporation to go on so that there is humidity will rise. But if humidity is already high, which is there is more already more vapor in the atmosphere, evaporation rate reduces. And that is what makes you sweat, especially on some hot afternoons when humidity is so high and there will be rain in the evening. You start feeling sticky. You feel sticky because the moisture is no longer going back up into the atmosphere like it's supposed to go for you to cool down so you get warm. Okay. And then the third factor is wind speed. So the higher the wind speed, the more evaporation goes on because the higher the wind speed, the more air, moist air is carried or displaced into the atmosphere. And the more cooler air comes to displace the warm air. And then atmospheric pressure is the fifth factor. If uh, the atmospheric pressure is low, evaporation is high. When the atmospheric pressure is high, evaporation rates are low. So those are the factors that affect evaporation. Now, the next point that we'll consider is the techniques or the how we measure evap evaporation. Now, the methods that we use are about five. There are these are some are combined other some some of them combine other methods. Some also are just methods that stand on their own. The first technique we use is what we call the water 
budget method called the storage uh, method. We also have what we call the mass transfer method, which in effect relates to what we call the energy budget method. And then the plan measurement and the lysimeters. I'll explain uh, all this. I'll give the background of this. Most of this are also itemized very well in the text I've provided. So water balance uh, method. This method is very simple. What it does is, it's, you know, remember when we started hydrology, we dealt with water budget, which is estimating <coughs> how much water is in the catchment. What is the incoming water and the outgoing water? If you're able to itemize the components of this uh, uh, equation, which is like accounting for how much water, how much money comes into your pocket at the end of the month, how much is going in, how much is coming in, you should be able to itemize the other unknown. So if you know how much precipitation is coming in, which is the total water coming into your catchment, this should be uh, equal to the runoff plus evaporation plus storage. And if you are not uh, estimate, if you are able to estimate the others, and the other three, you should be able to estimate evaporation. So you make evaporation the subject, and then you are able to quantify uh, what evaporation is by knowing precipitation run of the story. Now the problem with doing this is itemizing or calculating all these other parameters is extremely difficult. Instrumenting a site to determine the exact amount of precipitation is difficult because we all know the difficulties with me measuring precipitation. Precipitation varies through time and through space. So it's difficult to really pin down precipitation. Again, runoff is also very difficult to characterize because Different surface characteristics produce different runoff behaviors, not to talk about the storage that will result. So it's very difficult to characterize evaporation using the water budget. But on a long term approach, you can try it because on the long term, all these components eventually balance out. And uh, what the gate comes out on a catchment scale is good enough to yield some good estimates. So you can do that if you are doing this on a catchment scale. But on a very small scale, you will be having a lot of uncertainties because of the uh, difficulties with uh, characterizing uh, the other component of uh, the water budget. So that's the first approach. And you can find more detail in the text that I've provided. The second approach is the mass transfer or the energy concept. What we do here is we analyze how much uh, sunshine is coming in in terms of energy. It's coming in into the onto your catchment. How much sunshine is radiated? How much is absorbed by water bodies? How much is absorbed by the ground? And then you use these parameters to use these parameters to estimate uh, how much evaporation is going on. And that is so that is the energy approach. The mass approach is using uh, what we call vapor flux and wind speeds to estimate how much evaporation. And the techniques that we use are what we call the Dalton model and the Conway or the Holtzman model. These concepts are very long. If you look into the text, they have long equations. You need to determine a lot of parameters. You need a lot of meteorological information from the Met Office to do this analysis. It can also get complicated. And it, but, um, if you're able to <coughs> organize and get all the parameters that are required, you will still get a good estimate of how much evaporation is going on. And the energy budget is what I've already uh, preempted already. You use the energy of the sun that is coming in, how much is reflected by surface water, how much is reflected by the ground, how much is absorbed by the ground to estimate evaporation, which is and then in this one, because the parameters are a lot, there are some of them you can actually ignore. Uh, if you, you simplify the parameters and ignore some of them, you can be able to do your estimates and determine what needs to be used to determine evaporation. Um, and <clears throat> in analyzing this, this um, formulas lead to what we call the Penman's equation. You can read better, you can read further about this. And what you need to do the Penman um, calculation is the air temperature, the vapor pressure, Sunshine hours. So if you are in, a, in the tropics, you know where we live in Ghana. We have about almost 12 hours of sunshine, 12 hours of uh, darkness. If you are in the if you are in the 
temperate areas, you need to consider the time of year you are doing your analysis because there are, there are times where you have 18 hours of sunshine and six hours of darkness. And there are times where you have um, about 18 hours of darkness and six hours of sunshine. So you need to be, be know your, your, your position on the globe and how to use that to estimate know what parameters you want to choose you also have to consider the wind speed two meters above the ground and then the incoming solar radiation so this gets this can be get this can get very complicated you need a lot of met office information to get this to work um the most easiest of the technique that we use in in evaporation estimation is what we call the pan evaporation technique it's a very simple technique so what do you have is what we call a pan. We use a pan we call the plus A pan. In fact, all of us can do that at home. Where you have a basin of water, you put water in the basin, the sun shines, and you realize the water level drops in the basin. You pour water back to bring the water back to a particular mark. You do this, and then at the end of the day, how much water you've put on with your evaporation. It's very simple and easy to do. But to standardize and to ensure that all hydrologists across the world are doing the same thing. We have what we call the pan A or the class, the class pan A. So as you can see in the picture, it's a very simple pan. And the pan is put on a on a on a on a on a on a support, and then we have these gauges here. They just measure how much water is lost. So so that you don't have to put a ruler or anything in there to measure. These gauges they measure how much water is displaced from the pan. So you pour water in there, you monitor. The, the gauges will monitor how much water is lost uh, at the end of the day. And it's the same as you pouring water to, re, re, um, to replenish to a particular mark on in your pan. At the end of the day, between 8:30 at the beginning of the day, 8:30 and 17:30 hours, we check how much water is in and how much how much how much water is lost. Knowing this for the day enables you to determine. How much evaporation is going on for that particular day if you do this continuously for the whole month you determine how much water is lost to evaporation in the pan at the end of the month you keep doing this for each of the months you can, you can get this for how much evaporation occurs within the whole year okay and um because uh, you know this is a pan this is not like the normal ground this is not like the normal surface of the there will be it's not the same. It's as if you are trying to model something from nature into an artificial pan. So what we do is we want to correct for these evaporation differences. So we have what we call the pan coefficient. We use the pan coefficient to correct how much the pan gives us to determine the real evaporation parameter. Now, hydrologists have done a lot of analysis on some of these pans and on localities, and we know what factors to use if you want to use a coefficient and what i'll do is the next time i'll present a presentation of a um, few calculations on using the pan coefficient okay. so once you know the parameters that you're dealing with where you're standing or the locality and the pan coefficient you can calculate, convert the pan evaporation to real evaporation uh, by the pan coefficient the, the last approach is what we call lysimeters Lysimeters are very, very, they are, they, are, they are a way of modeling how much real evaporation is going on. Because what we do is we dig the ground. So we dig the ground, we put in a big cylinder to monitor flows that are coming. So we dig the ground, we put what we call the lysimeter into the ground, and then we cover it up with the, the soil and put vegetation back on. What we are trying to do is to mimic or model uh, a reality. But you and I know, once you take out the soil and put the lysimeter back, you have disturbed the sample. So these are some of the weaknesses you experience if you use the lysimeter, but it still gives you some good measurement. So you dig the ground, put the lysimeter in there, cover back, cover the lysimeter back with soil, and put back the vegetation on. And then what you do is it rains. Within the lysimeter, we have a weighing scale okay a weighing scale and cylinders that measure how much rain is coming in how much passes through the soil so you have 
carrying gauge on top, you determine how much rain is coming in. Then you have these gauges or these cylinders in the glycimeter. That will determine how much water infiltrates through the ground into the glycimeter. Then you do what we do at the end of it, we weigh how much water comes into these cylinders. And knowing the mass of water that comes in, we can determine how much volume of water because we know the density of water. Using this, we can be able to estimate how much water has passed through, how much water has been saved through the ground as filtration, how much water rained. The difference gives us the evaporation. Very easy, but the difference is this is very complex to do because you need to dig a big ground like a room. A big room, you know, installing a lysimeter in the ground for a big room it can be difficult. The design itself, the setup it can be very complex and very difficult to put together. So, that is, but it will still give you a good uh, amount, give you, give you an est give you estimate of evaporation. But the difficulty is the setup and then the disturbance of nature itself that gives. Um, some uncertainty on what we uh, we determine. Okay. So these are the five methods we use to measure um, evaporation.